Hello students, in today's lecture, I will be discussing about two very important concepts of ecology, that is keystone and umbrella spaces. But at the onset, I would like to mention that this presentation is the part of the initiative taken up by Geological Society of Assam. I have prepared this presentation mainly for the students of geology. Through this presentation, I am trying to explain basic concept of keystone spaces, role of keystone spaces in ecosystem function, related concept like guild concept, categorization of keystone spaces, examples of keystone spaces, basic concept of umbrella spaces and importance of umbrella spaces along with the examples. From this presentation, students will be able to know how natural biota could be conserved and protected through prioritizing spaces that help to maximize the biological diversity. I hope this presentation will be helpful for all of them. So let us start with keystone spaces and their role in ecosystem. As the name implies, keystone spaces play key roles in ecosystem. Keystone spaces are those spaces which play an unique or crucial role in ecosystem function. The concept of keystone spaces was introduced in 1969 by Professor Robert T. Pine and he was a professor of geology of University of Washington. So let me explain you in details about keystone spaces. You know, in ecosystem, different types of species constitute the community, plays a great role towards the ecosystem functioning. You know, the function is generally considered a synonym for processes. And ecosystem function is a general term that includes stock of materials like carbon, water, mineral, nutrients, etc., and rates of processes including fluxes of energy and matter between trophic levels and environment. These functioning of the ecosystem are performed by the combination of different group of species present there. But among all the species present in a community, certain species play a major role for controlling the entire community. Likewise, in our society also, very limited person take the major leading role to conduct various function, leading various organization, political activities, etc. and drive the whole community towards the aspirated goal. Certain single spaces in a community can support large numbers of other spaces and provide food, shelter, and protection. The absence of these spaces can be unknowingly detrimental for the survival of most of other members of the community. Means, without these important spaces, the ecosystem balance has been disrupted and certain spaces may even extinct from the system. Such type of important spaces are known as keystone species. The guild or role concept of the community organization is a new concept. Guild, you know, it's a group of species exploiting a common resource base in a similar fashion. I want to give one example. Hummingbirds and other nectar feeding birds in tropical areas form a guild exploiting a set of 
flowering plants. Here I have written, the guild is an ecological unit, not a taxonomic unit. I just want to explain this by, if we consider avian community, different species forming different guilds, like frugivorous, nectarivorous, insectivorous, granivorous, feeding guild, etc. Here we can see that under columbiformis order, spotted dove falls under granivorous feeding guild, whereas yellow-legged green pigeon falls under frugivorous feeding guild. Again, under frugivorous feeding guild, along with the yellow-legged green pigeon, which is from the columbiformis, hornbills from Coraciformis and coel from Cuculiformis order coming under same guild. And if we consider any animal community in desert habitat, we can found that ants, rodents, which is a mammal, birds all eat seeds and thus form a single guild, which is the granivorous feeding guild with great taxonomic diversity. A community can be viewed as a complex assembly of component gills. It's containing one or more species. Gills may interact with one another within the community and species composition of the gills may change from year to year. A community always has a group of roles, but the roles may be packed with different numbers of species. Roles, I mean to say the functional role played by different species in a community. One thing you should have to be clear that the number of sets or roles within a community is small in relation to the number of species and might be constant in different communities. There may be a limit on the number of spaces that can simultaneously fill a given role. A role may be occupied by a single species and the presence of that role may be critical to the community. The functional role may be performed by a single species and that particular species may be responsible for controlling the entire community. That means the functional role must be maintained or performed by a particular important species for the existence of the entire community. If the important species is absent, who will perform that particular functional role or activities within the ecosystem? That species cannot be replaced by any other species in the ecosystem. Such important species are called as keystone species because their activities determine community structure. Keystone species often existing relatively limited numbers in the ecosystems. And because of their often smaller number, keystone species are more vulnerable to extinction than other species. These are most easily recognized by removal experiment. That means we can recognize the keystone species in a particular ecosystem with the help of removal experiment. That is, remove one after another species from the community and observe the effect. Without removal experiment, it is not possible to know which species is involved in community control in a particular natural ecosystem. Their pivotal impact is often not appreciated until they are absent. This point also explained that keystone species are usually detected when they are removed and disappeared from a system. The absence of the keystone species resulted in dramatic changes to the rest of the community.
keystone spaces may be relatively rare in natural communities or they may be common but not recognized. Various scientists across the globe have been studied the role of keystone spaces after the drastically decline of certain spaces from the ecosystem and a situation occurred afterwards. There are five generally recognized categories of keystone spaces like keystone predators, keystone modifiers, also called as keystone engineers, keystone prey, keystone mutualist, and keystone host. Here I have given some example of keystone spaces like lobster, starfish, sea otter, African elephant, and fake plants. With the help of this flowchart, I like to explain why we consider lobster as a keystone species. Lobster is a keystone species in subtidal communities off the east coast of Canada. Lobsters have been heavily exploited by the fishermen, and as a result, the sea urchin population have increased. Sea urchin are herbivores that can control the distribution of the algae. Population explosion of the sea urchin result in the elimination of sea weed species like laminaria and elaria and have produced large areas of nearly barren rock. Means loss of productivity occurs in subtidal community and the whole subtidal ecosystem become imbalance. On the other hand, you can see that in normal condition, in the right hand side of the flowchart, you can see equilibrium level of lobster population exists. So predatory nature of lobster control the sea urchin and as a result of which seaweed population become abundant. So good community structure and high productivity occurs in the subtidal community. Thus, balancing this community structure and ecosystem functioning become good. Thus, the predatory activities of lobster becomes a key factor in structuring this subtidal community. Now I like to explain the second example of keystone spaces that is sea otter. Sea otter is an example of keystone spaces. Let's assume a simple scenario. In ocean, most of the reasons you can see the presence of kelp forest. Kelp also called as underwater forest. You know, it is a large brown seaweed growing together in the same place, which is home for many vertebrates, particularly the fish species and invertebrates. We can found multiple population of different species over there because it is a home for them. There is one threat for kelp forest, that is sea urchin, which eat kelp and ultimately destroy the kelp forest. And the species which survive within the kelp forest also eliminated. So if sea urchin is there, less kelp forest in ocean and less other species are also present. So presence of sea urchin ultimately destroy the other species indirectly. So as the sea otter present there, it reduces the population of the sea urchin and as a result, Kelp forest can easily grow and other species also come back to the kelp forest. So presence of sea otter indirectly help thousands of vertebrate and invertebrate species in ocean. That is life of many species may rely on abundance of the sea otter. Here I have given the explanation of the previous flowchart. I told you that the sea otter was once common 
along the Pacific coast of North America, from Alaska to Baza, California, that determine the structure of near shore marine communities. Sea otters feed primarily on sea urchin when they are available. In the absence of such predation, when sea otters are hunted by the far trappers, urchin populations overgraze their algal food sources and prevent kelp establishment. Experimental urchin removal in subtidal quadrats in southeastern Alaska produce rapid colonization by kelp and the site become dominated by Laminaria groenlandica. The reintroduction of the sea otters has resulted in a dramatic increase in kelp biomass and this has in turn increased the abundance of near shore fishes. The removal of sea otters by far trappers in 19th century does had significant major impacts on the organization of subtidal communities. As sea otters spread back along the Pacific coast, a reversal is occurring and dense kelp beds are appearing again. Scientists consider African elephant to be keystone species of grassland community as they help to maintain suitable habitat for many other species in savanna and forest ecosystem. I think you know there are two types of elephants in Africa. One is African bush elephant or African savanna elephant. The scientific name is Loxodonta africana which is larger than the other. The other one is African forest elephant or Loxodonta cyclotis. Here I like to talk about savanna elephant or African bush elephant. In the savanna, they can reduce bush cover to create an environment favorable to grazing animals. The African elephant is a relatively unspecialized herbivore but relies on a diet of browse supplemented by grass. That means it is a browser, mostly feed tree saplings, tree twigs, roots, shrubs, etc. as primary food and their secondary food is grass. In case of Asian elephant, they are primarily grazer. By their feeding activities, elephant destroy shrubs and small trees and push woodland habitat towards open grassland. Large mature trees can be destroyed by elephants feeding on the bark. As more grasses invade the woodland habitat, the frequency of fire increases, which accelerates the conversion of the woodland to grassland. The conversion works become disadvantaged for the elephant because grass is not sufficient diet for the elephant, for the African elephant, and they begin to starve as woody species are eliminated. And other ungulate species that graze the grasses are favored by elephants' activities. Fig trees or ficus trees in tropical ecosystem are considered as keystone species. Fig trees have been promoted as framework species for tropical forest restoration throughout Asia because they are considered as keystone species. Fig trees are often considered ecologically significant keystone species because they sustain population of many dispersing animals that feed on their fruits. It is so important to the animals of tropical ecosystem because figs bear fruits several times a year. Next important concept I like to discuss today is the umbrella species. Umbrella species are those species 
whose occupancy area if we consider plant it will be occupancy area and if we consider animal it will be home range so umbrella species are those species whose occupancy area or home range are large enough and whose habitat requirements are wide enough that if they are given a sufficient large areas for their protection it will bring other species under that protection umbrella species are selected with assumption that protection of their habitat will serve as an umbrella to protect many other species with similar habitat requirement frankel and soul were the first to use the term umbrella in 1981 fleisman et al 2000 recently suggested a broadly applicable definition for an umbrella species according to them a species whose conservation confers a protective umbrella to numerous co-occurring species is considered as a umbrella species there is no international criteria for selecting animals to serve as umbrella species but generally they tend to be large mammals or birds since they tend to have greatest range of environment and often have a large impact on their ecosystem many times endangered or vulnerable types of animals are chosen because more people know about them or because environmental legislation can be more easily used to protect them umbrella species are typically species with large area requirement such as grizzly bear or habitat specialist such as red cockaded woodpecker habitat specialist that means the species are endemic so they have been considered as umbrella species as they are priority species for conservation but they may also include animals that are relatively easy to count such as butterflies some habitat types may also act as umbrellas and these can be wider than those provided by large vertebrates in south africa for example the extraordinary rich plant species in the cap the cap floral kingdom serve as an umbrella species for many specialist invertebrates different examples of umbrella species are recognized in natural habitat here i have given a few of them northern spotted owl of northwestern united states is considered as umbrella species which is found in the old growth forest of North America where mollusks and salamanders are also protected within their protection. Baseacre spot butterfly of grassland habitat of America is also considered as an umbrella species. Sage grouse of North America is also considered as umbrella species. Next is the grizzly bear of North America. Grizzly bear, gray wolf, Florida panther, all these three are fall under both of the category of the keystone species and the umbrella species. Tiger, bison, rhinoceros, elephants, all are considered also as umbrella species. Tiger is an umbrella species and for the conservation of the tiger, at least 800 to 1200 square kilometer area is needed to maintain the viable population of 80 to 100 individuals. So for protecting tiger, large area had been declared as tiger reserve and lots of other animals are also survived under this protection.
These are the reviewed journal articles and books which I have been followed during the preparation of this presentation. Thank you so much.